receiver unit is actually right here. So don't aim it at me. I don't want to be irradiated. But it's actually, this is the receiver doohickey right there. Huh. So how many people have tried voting on this so far? That's more than 43. <laughs> Okay, everybody try voting again. Let's see if the number goes up. Yes? Turning point. Who what? Can I? So it should look, it should look something like this. Yes, no? Does this look at all sort of familiar? Thank you. Huh. Okay, I'll bring up a, um, uh, a picture of the clicker in a moment or two. Okay, well, 43 people. Um, well, that's really good. So 30% like oh. purple, which is either green or red. I'm sorry. Red is blue, and one is red. Oh, so people could actually figure out um, how to enter. Oh, right. Mauve is red, and red is mauve. <laughs> Okay, so as you can tell, uh, I need to do a little work on this. Um, <laughs> okay. The clickers themselves look like this. Or, okay, they will look like this as soon as it loads up. There we go. Right, there's me running. Oops. No. Who? So, is, was this the one in front of the CS101 textbooks? Yeah. <laughs> huh. This is the one I got for Ken. I think if it looks. I think it's the same thing. So, if you look on the back, um, it's, if it says www.turningtechnologies.com, maybe fourth line down. Then it should work. Uh, right. Okay. Well, so I will I will investigate that. I want to move through the lecture notes, so I'll actually look at that um, offline, meaning after class. In the meantime, we now have favorite colors. Bob is like a purple, right? It's kind of purplish shade. And isn't chartreuse like a hot pink or something like that? No. Who knows what a chartreuse is? Light green. Light green. Okay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Shh. <laughs> so I wanted to finish up um, a couple things in terms of um, the slide set that we were talking about for the last couple of days and move on to the next slide set. Um, some people had commented in the, the lab um, comments you know, when you fill out suggestions and, and other general comments, I actually do read those. Um, so please feel free to leave lots of comments because I read them and consider them and, and whatnot. Um, to a certain extent, the stuff that I'm going over in lecture is sort of following the textbook, but not exactly. And that's actually by design because you really don't need me here to read the textbook to you. Um, and what I'm trying to do is have lecture present things in a slightly different format. In the past, I know students, a lot of students have found that that actually helps because they get one view of the same, you know, they get sort of two different views of the same material, one from the, the lecture and, and, of course, the, the slides that I um, use, and one from the textbook. So right now we're maybe in the middle or about two-thirds of the way through Chapter 2. I expect we'll spend probably all of this week finishing up Chapter 2, and then sometime next week, maybe Monday, maybe Wednesday, we'll be moving on into chapter three. At one point or another, we will cover all of chapter two, except for this section on dialogue boxes. Anything on GUIs, I don't really want to go over in, in the course this semester, because it ends up confusing people. Excuse me. A GUI is a graphical user interface, um, pop-up windows and buttons and that sort of stuff. And while it's really cool to be able to program in it, uh, I've found it confuses people more than it helps. So, that being said, I wanted to talk a bit about casting. 
We've talked about types. You have ints, doubles, and some of the types we don't see quite as often, longs, uh, floats, that sort of stuff. So consider this code, double D equals 3.6. Pretty straightforward. It's going to create a variable called D <laughs> of type double and give it value 3.6. And then I say int x equals math.round D. What that will do is it'll take 3.6, round it to the nearest whole number, in this case 4, and that's what that particular function does. Math.round, like math.cosine, math.square root, it's one of the many mathematical functions available in the aptly named math library. But you try putting this in Java, and they complain about a loss of precision. <coughs> and the reason <coughs> is a bit complicated, but, well, it's a bit annoying, more so than complicated. Math.round returns a log. And a log, if you remember, is <coughs> an, uh, an inch can go from negative 2 billion and change to positive 2 billion and change. A log can hold a lot greater values and a lot smaller values. It can hold 10 trillion, for example. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to take a long and stuff it into an int. <clears throat> so this is a bit um, abstract example. But <clears throat> I'm going to show another example that explains this loss of precision a bit better. The easy way to fix this is to do this. What this is saying is this is specifically telling Java that color will do even though Java and you and me know that math.round returns a long, we are specifically telling Java that I want to convert it to an int. And this way I can store it in an int. So that fact that I have ints there in parentheses is converting what's on the right into some uh, int value. <clears throat> so you know, and this is called a cast, C-A-S-T. The type name is always in parentheses. And it basically will convert what's ever on the right into whatever value is in the cast. <clears throat> so basically, you're telling Java it's fine to do this. <clears throat> well, why does that matter? Right, it's called cast. And the type name is in parentheses. So look at this code. Double D equals 3.6, int x equals int d. If I didn't have this int here, then you're trying to stick the value 3.6 into an integer variable x. And what's going to happen is you're going to lose some of the value. The 0.6 part is going to disappear because an int can only hold integer numbers. Now keep in mind when you do this, it's going to truncate it, meaning it's going to cut it off. It's not going to round it. So if you tried doing this, um, Java would say something about loss of precision. And what they mean, about, what Java means about the loss of precision is the 0.6 part is being lost. Or about, what's that? A quarter of your value, or 20% of your value, is disappearing. <coughs> so when you actually put the int in there, you're telling Java it's OK to do this. You're aware that you're going, you may very well lose whatever's after the decimal point, and you're fine with that. And then Java won't complain. <clears throat> so this is what it's talking about, about loss of precision. Some amount of the value may disappear. And you're telling it it's fine. <clears throat> so let's look at this code. Int x equals 300. Byte b equals byte x. And then <coughs> print out b. So s is an int, and it can hold anywhere from negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. <coughs> b is a byte, and can hold anywhere from negative 128 to positive 127. You'll notice that a byte variable cannot hold th the value 300. Remember, there's three integer, uh, uh, four integer variable types, byte, short, int, and long. Byte can hold about 128. Short can hold about 32,000. It can hold about 2 billion. Long can hold a lot more. And what's happening here is that you're trying to um, stick a very large value into a variable that cannot hold it. So again, if I was to cross this out, Java would complain about a loss of precision. In this case, Java can't hold three, the value 300 in the variable b, and you're going to lose some of it. In particular, um, so Java would complain about loss of precision because you're sticking a really big value into a variable that can't hold it. 
However, of course, when you put that in there, you tell Java it's fine to do it. You don't care what happens as a result. And it turns out, right, but I can only hold similar values. It turns out that 44 is stuck in there. The point is that Java doesn't know what to do with the extra couple hundred, or I guess 163, that are sticking around in there, or 173, right? If the maximum byte value is 127, then there's 173 left over to make 300. Java doesn't know what to do with it. It just does something almost seemingly at random, and you get the value of 44. I'm sorry? We get 44 twice. Yes. Actually, there is a reason why, there's a specific reason why it gets 44, but that deals with how numbers are stored in binary, and I wasn't going to go into that. So this is the whole loss of precision. Now, imagine a long. If you were to take a long that was 10, let's see, 10 billion, and you try sticking that into an int, an int can only hold 2.5 billion. So you're going to lose a lot of the value, and it's going to give you, you know, like negative 17 or something strange like that. So this is why Java complains if you try to stick a big value into a smaller variable. So going back a slide, that's what's happening there. Because you're trying to stick a really big value into a variable that can't necessarily hold it. Now, in this particular example, sure, the integer x can hold 3, I'm sorry, 4, and the long can hold 4, and the byte can hold 4, but Java doesn't actually check what the value is. Java just knows that in some cases, math.round will return a value that can't be stored in x, specifically 10 billion as one example. So this is what casting is. You will see this from time to time. I will go over this again when the time draws, when we actually need to start using it, and there will be points when we need to start using it again. Right, you saw this whole slide. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. The last couple of slides in this set deal with print and print line. And someone had asked the question, what's the difference between them? And now we'll talk about that. So in this particular one, you'll notice that this is print, and this is print line. Print ln, usually you pronounce print line. So it turns out that system is part of the Java library, and system.out deals with printing to the screen. System.in deals with reading from the keyboard. So when you call system.out.println, what you're doing is you're saying, I want to print something to the screen. That's sometimes called the standard output stream, just like system.in, or when you create a scanner, you call it standard in for standard input stream, just because that's the standard way that things are output to the user. Sure, there are other ways, like a printer, but generally most interaction with the computer is through a screen. And there's two methods in system.out that we really care about, print and print line. And the difference between them is whether or not a it moves, the cursor moves to the next line. So as an example, consider this. Now notice that the first one, the yellow one, is print, and all of the others are print line. When I call system.out.print, what it's going to do is just print out foo. And the cursor is going to be right there. And when I say cursor is going to be right there, I mean that's where it's going to start printing the next, that's where it's going to start printing next. Then I do bar, and it prints it right where I stopped. Now bar is printed with a print line, which means the cursor is then going to move to the successive line. When you call print out with just empty parentheses, it skips a line, calls foo, that's a print line, so it moves to the next line, and then bar again. So essentially the difference between print and print line is solely whether the cursor, and here when I say the cursor, I mean where the next thing printed is going to be, stays at the end of that line or moves to the next line. So that's why foo and bar are both printed on the same line. This is a print, and print doesn't move to the next line for the next line of code. Foo bar. 
Question. Is there a difference between using the first line and putting a sledge head in the string? No. And we'll actually see that on the next, about two slides from now. So there's a question that I'm going to address in two slides, so I won't actually repeat the question for a minute or two. Other questions, comments, concerns? How many people feel they understand the difference between print and print line? Okay, good. So the next question becomes, if you want to print out a string to, print out something to the screen, how does Java know where to stop? So if I was to put in a print statement, that Java knows that a string starts at a double quotes, and it knows it ends at the next double quotes, right? So it's going to essentially, when it reads through it, it sees double quotes, it knows the string is starting, and it's going to count everything in there until it hits the next set of double quotes. And that's how it knows the string. And this string happens to have seven characters, if you imagine there's a space between the two of them. So that's how it knows where the string begins and ends, by the double quotes. The question is, what if you wanted to make a string that contains a number of double quotes? So what if you wanted your string to be three sets of double quotes? So this is the double quotes that starts the string, the intent is that to start the string. That's the one that ends the string. And your string now contains three double quotes. So your string is a line three and contains double quotes. The problem is, is how do you tell this to the computer? Sure, a human can look at this and probably figure it out. But Java's going to look, say, oh, a string starts, a string ends. A string starts, and a string ends. And then a string starts. So the problem is that Java doesn't know. You can't just put a double quote inside a string, because Java's not going to realize that you want that as part of the string. Java's going to think that you mean for the string to end. So obviously, there are lots of times we want to have double quotes. And what we do then is we put a backslash in front of it. So if I was to write this string, if I was to write it this way, So now there's a total of eight characters on here. Quote, slash, quote, slash, quote, slash, quote, quote. Now when Java sees this combination, a backslash and a quote, it knows that you don't mean for the string to end. It knows that you mean for a quote to be part of the string. So it looks at this, and it's going to see a total of three characters. That's one character which Java knows, even though you put a backslash quote, it knows that you mean it as um, a, just a double quote. That's the second character. There's the third character. So the reason we put backslashes in there is if we want certain characters to be able to be printed properly, such as a double quote. Well, it turns out that there's a whole number of other things, other characters that we want to print it properly, which are all listed up here, and I'll get to in a minute. Yes? Good question. So the, one of the, the question that was raised is, what if you want to print a backslash? Because what if you want your string to contain two characters, a backslash and then a double quote? Well, if you just do backslash double quote, that Java looks at that and sees one character. So anytime you want a backslash, you put two backslashes in there. So basically, anytime Java sees a backslash, it knows that you are telling it there's a special character, and it's going to look at the next one. So if it sees a backslash, it ignores that backslash, and it includes this as part of the string. It sees another backslash, includes that as part of the string. So that's how you would do a backslash with two backslashes. If you wanted a double quote, you'd have that. If you wanted a tab as opposed to a series of spaces, you'd have that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm going to talk about the rest of these. But essentially, anytime Java sees a backslash, it knows that whatever character is coming next, so it, it, it doesn't use that backslash in the string, but knows whatever character is coming next, it's going to use that in the string as opposed to having it be, for example, the terminating double quote. 
How many people feel that they're good so far? So, when would you use this? Consider this code. We have a number of backslashes here. Right? All of those are the backslashes. And some of these are tabs. And what a tab will do is it'll make sure everything nicely lines up in columns. Others allow a double quote when you're talking about um, sorry, you know, a double quote, for example, when you're talking about inches. So this would actually print this out. And you'll notice that everything nicely lines up in columns because we have all the tabs. And everything lines up in columns here. And then all of these double quotes, which we wanted printed out to the screen, were printed out because we all backslash them. Well, it turns out for mostly historical reasons, they're called escape sequences. Um, and they're often referred to as escaped. So you escape a backslash or you escape a double quote. It just means you add a backslash in front of it. For various reasons, they're, they're just called escape sequences. It's kind of an archaic term, but that's what I won't call it. So what you can also do is a backslash n. And what that allows you to do is to have lots of blank lines. So what you, um, oops. you can have a print statement This is answering your question. A print statement that just prints foo backslash n. So it's going to print out foo and then move to the next line. That is the exact same thing, or pretty much the exact same thing, as that. Imagine we had system that out in front of it and a semicolon after it. This one will print out the string foo backslash n, so it moves to the next line. This prints out foo, and because it's a print line, it will move to the next line. Okay, questions? Say that again? Um, oh, the question is, what? so what happens if you put in a print or a print line more than a certain number of characters? Um, the, the black console window that pops up when you run a Java program is about 80 characters wide. And if you put in more than 80 characters in there, it'll just sort of wrap it to the next line. Um, and then right in the middle of the word, it doesn't do you know nice word wrap like Microsoft Word does, for example. Just right in the middle of the word, the characters will move on to the next line. And it kind of makes it hard to read. Oh, both of them will do that. Both of them will, will just Start one, once it is character 80 on that line, it just wraps it to the next line. So the question dealt with the fact that there is an escape sequence for a single quote. Well, you'll notice here. There was no escape sequence for it. Well, it turns out, when, when Java's looking through, it sees the string starts there. It knows that the string is not going to end there because that's escaped. And it knows that the string does end there. So the single quote does not present the problem in this case. right? Java knows that the string is not going to end there. But if I wanted to say character C equals a single quote, then that becomes a bit of a problem. So when you are want to put a sing, if you want to have a character variable that holds a single character, which happens to be the single quote, that's when you'd actually have to use the backslash. Here you could use it, but it's not required. Okay.
And of all the things that they're selecting that they could do, they're setting the deadline. All right. So actually, one other thing I forgot to mention. Somebody left a Chinese journal in the lab on the first week. It's definitely a CS101 person, but doesn't list a name. So if this belongs to you, then come get it after lecture. OK. So we've talked so far about variables. We've talked about types. We can create variables, stick values into them. We know our operators, addition, subtraction, modulus, and a couple other things. I want to start moving into objects. Now, Java is an object-oriented programming language. And through the course of the semester, we're going to see exactly what that means and why that's actually useful. Uh, and what I'm going to do today and, and for the rest of this week is introduce you to objects, what objects are, how we use them, and why they're so useful. So numbers. And when I talk about numbers, I also mean variables. They have a value, but they, don't, they can't do anything by themselves. We can tell Java to add two numbers together, 5 plus 2. But we're specifically saying, I'm going to do addition on 5 and 2. Um, and the other thing to note is that a number has one and only one value. Right? The integer 5 just has 5. Pi is just 3.1415, et cetera, et cetera. We cannot represent complex numbers. Remember, complex numbers is 3 plus 2i. So there's actually two values there. But we can't represent those in the ways, ways that we have seen so far in the course. So that's what brings in objects. And an objects have both attributes and behaviors. So an attribute is some sort of property, and a behavior is something that they can do. And we've started using some of those. System.out.println, that's a behavior. Math.sign, that's a behavior. Um, and in particular, they can have multiple values or multiple attributes. So the first thing we do is we create an object. Scanner standard in equals new scanner system dot in. All object creation is going to look kind of like this. This is the type of the object or the class. And I'm going to get into the class type distinction in a bit. This is the name. And then there's some new line over on the right. So that creates an object. Whatever an object is, that creates it. And this particular object standard in has a whole number of behaviors. We've seen, in particular, two of them. We've seen next int and next double. Right. Then we use the object. Standard in dot next int. I'm saying from that object that I've just created, which I conveniently call standard in, I'm going to call the next int method. And the next int method is going to go off, um, and all by itself, it's going to get a value from the keyboard. Or standard in dot next double, which pretty much does the same thing, but reads in a double instead of an int. And this is when we talk about behaviors. A behavior in Java is a method or a function. We've seen many of them. System.out.println, that is a behavior. Uh, math dot square root. That's a behavior. I think that's all we've seen so far. Um, and essentially, it's something that the object does. We tell the object, I, you know, go execute your next int method or go do this thing, and it goes and takes care of it. So you'll notice that we don't actually know how next int works, and we don't have to know how next int works. It doesn't matter for us. We know how to use it. As an analogy, consider your car radio. How many people really know how a car radio works? Well, some might. I would say 99% of the people out there in the world who use car radios probably don't know how it receives radio frequency broadcasts out of thin air. That's my guess. I mean, it's certainly a very high percentage that don't know how it works. But even though we don't know how a radio works, we can still go ahead and use it because all radios are kind of the same, right? You have tuning, you have volume, you have power. You can shove a CD in there at times. Um, but the point there is that even though we don't know how it works, we can still use it. Here, even though we don't know exactly how next it works, how does it really communicate with the keyboard? How does it you know, read in that value? How does it tell if it's an int or not? We don't really know. And certainly for now in this course, 
that's fine. We can still go ahead and use that particular method or that particular behavior. Of course, we could have called it and stamped it in anything that we wanted to. So let's create a different type of object. And this is a rectangle object. So a rectangle object, rectangles have a lot of properties or a lot of attributes. They have a height, they have a width, uh, they have a position, where it is, we'll imagine it's in some 2D world. Maybe it has a color, maybe it has a line thickness. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of properties you could potentially say a rectangle has. Your int variable x only has one property, five, or whatever it is. A rectangle that we create, I mean, I've just listed six properties, you could probably keep going. Does it have a nice pretty pattern? Is there a separate color for the line as for the, you know, the inside of the rectangle? Et cetera, et cetera. So a rectangle object, you'll notice we need to keep many values uh, for a rectangle object. Now, all these Um, so, like, if we're going to write, uh, write a code to call it blue to color a sphere or something like that. The question had to do with, with how this is stored. Um, I, I'm going to kind of ignore exactly how it's stored for a little bit just because I don't want to get into too much. I want you to sort of see how, how to use them before we get into how it's stored. But essentially, um, if you imagine a big blob that's the rectangle object, um, somewhere in there, it stores the half dozen properties that we want. Height, width, x, location, y, location, color. It sort of stores them all together, and it knows that those six particular properties are for that rectangle object. I'm, I'm purposely being a bit vague on that. So let's create a rectangle. Rectangle R equals new rectangle 10, 20. Now you'll notice a couple things. The word rectangle is listed both, okay, let's do chartreuse. It's listed both there and there. As far as, until we hit the last day of lecture, those two names must be the same. We still have our new here, which means we're creating a new object. And of course we have R. Again, we could have called it anything we wanted. We could have called this standard in wouldn't really make sense, but we could have. And then we provide two parameters. Those two parameters are telling the rectangle how to create itself. Essentially, this is going to create a rectangle of height 10 and width 20. Or reverse that. But those are the dimensions of the rectangle, whichever order they're in. <clears throat> so we've now created some rectangle, which is sitting somewhere in memory that has height 10 and width 20. Doesn't currently have a color, doesn't have a location, it just has a height and a width. When you don't have parameters, would we just have height of one? What did the computer do? You mean if you don't put parameters in there? Yeah. Uh, the question was, what happens if you don't put parameters in here? So I, for example, I said, <laughs> just rectangle and empty parentheses. Um, depending on the particular object you are creating, some objects will not like it if you try creating without parameters. Some will just create a rectangle of maybe a default size. So we're going to actually get into that. It turns out that there are many ways to create rectangles. We'll see a couple more of them later on. So objects have properties or attributes, right? A rectangle has at least as far as we've seen so far in this slide, a height and a width. Uh, well, we could then print out the width. And we could say system.out.println r.width. Now, what that's saying is that from the rectangle object r, and this is the rectangle object that we just created, I'm going to print out the width. And the period means from the object on the left, this is your left, from the object on the left, print out this particular property. So that's going to print out the width of that rectangle. That's going to print out the height of the rectangle. One prints out 10, one prints out 20. I forget which is which. An 
subjects also have behaviors or methods. <clears throat> R dot grow 10 comma 20. That's going to add 10 to the height and 20 to the width. So the height is now 20 and the width is now 40. So it grows or expands it a certain amount. R dot is empty. That will tell you, yes or no, true or false, whether or not the rectangle is empty. And empty means, for example, it has height and width of zero. R dot set location 5 comma 4. That's going to move the upper left corner of the rectangle to 5, 4 on a coordinate system. So these are all things that, again, we don't know exactly how grow works or set location works, but we know how to use it. We basically say from R, and R is what we've created up here, I'm going to call this particular method. Notice the dot is saying I'm going to call a method from that particular object. Here the dot is saying from the R object, I'm going to print out the height or print out the width. Let's talk about strings. We've talked uh, a little bit about strings before, but it turns out you can create some string objects as well. String s equals new string hello world. It looks pretty similar to the other creator mind. We have the class name here, or we have the word string here and here. S we could have called anything we wanted. New, and then some stuff in parentheses. So, all objects have properties. It turns out that the string class is, um, for various reasons, I don't want to say all objects have properties. Most objects have properties. The string class doesn't actually have any particularly useful ones. <clears throat> but it does have a number of behaviors or methods. For example, s.substring 0, 6. It's going to pull out a substring, in particular, hello. Or maybe hello space, whatever. But that's going to get just a certain part of the hello world string. S.index of world. That's going to find where in the string world starts. If it starts about six characters in, seven characters in, it's going to return somewhere around there, six or seven. S.2 lowercase. That's going to give you a string that's all lowercase, where the specifically the H of the hello is <laughs> converted to lowercase. So here we have a number of methods or behaviors that the string class can do. So objects are things, and whatever thing is, we're going to define thing later in the course, um, that have properties or attributes, however you want to refer to them, and behaviors or methods. In particular, properties are things like a rectangle. Its properties are height, width, uh, x location, y location, color, line thickness. Um, and attributes are things that, things that it can, I'm sorry, uh, behaviors are things that it can do. It can grow. It can change its location. It can do some, you know, things like that. So first we create objects, and then we manipulate them by calling their methods, setting their values, printing their values. This is generally what we're going to see, well, what you do in object-oriented programming. Obviously, it's simplified a bit here. Um, but you create objects, and then you start using their values by setting values, uh, computing things, and then reading those values in some various order. So why do we care? about all of this? Well, it turns out, when you first learn about objects, you're probably going to say, I can't imagine why I would ever use them. And then by the end of the semester, you'll probably say, I can't imagine how I ever programmed without objects. So let's say you wanted to do a lot of string manipulation. You had this program that had to read in all these strings and do some manipulation on them. Maybe um, when you get your email back for your grades, I need to pull out your first name. So if your name is John Michael Doe, the way it lists it in the, the registrar, your first it, it just lists your last name and your given name. It doesn't actually say what your first name is or what your middle name is. It just says, this is family name, this is given name. So somewhere in there, there's some code that has to go and figure out 
what the first name is. Basically, it looks for the space. It takes everything to the left of the space. So if your first name is, um, has a space in it, some people have two-word first names, uh, this system's probably going to call you by the wrong name. <clears throat> so let's go on to do some other string manipulation. Um, sure, you can write the methods to do that yourself, but it turns out that Sun has already written all of these things for you. And they're all in the string class. So in the Java library, they've already defined string, and they've already put all these methods in there. So you create a string object, and there are literally hundreds of methods that are already there that will help you to manipulate your strings. So you don't have to write the methods to do this. You just have to tell it how to operate the particular methods that are already written. So, and this is what's really nice about the Java library, is that you create objects and all, so many methods are already written for you. And that's one of the things that we're going to see in the first couple of homeworks. Right, 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 right. Okay. Do I have a minute or two to go over my next red slides? No? Okay. So, so Valentine's Day is coming up. And you've seen those little chocolate heart or um, chalk hearts that have such um, sweet sayings like, be mine, love you forever. This is the opposite. And these are called bittersweets, made by the same company that makes the motivators. And they have really cute sayings like these. <laughs> and you can actually buy these and start handing them out during Valentine's Day. And here are some more sayings. I'll see y'all on Wednesday. <laughs>